the uh, Conversations on the Edge Lecture Series. My name is Jan Balsam. I'm the Deputy Chief of Science Resource Management at Ken National Park. And we're really happy that you guys are here. Um, tonight I'm going to be introducing our speaker, but also uh, doing a little plug for the Grand Canyon Association, who is our sponsor. Uh, the association has been in existence since 1932 as a partner with Grand Canyon National Park, and they are responsible for a number of the lectures, um, the, certainly the ones that we're doing, uh, the Conversations on the Edge series, which uh, Carl Bowman is uh, speaking tonight. They also have the Community Lecture Series, Flagstaff, Glendale, and Prescott. So I'm hoping folks will pick um, up the flyers that are in the back of the room. Um, because all of the lectures are fascinating, great speakers, wonderful topics. Information in the back about the association, how you become a member. Some of us are lifetime members. I don't even offer that in my time I've been around. Um, and also a few other things like the Adopt a Line program. Got a little line back there. So please take a look at the table in the back for some of that information. Uh, within the program, we've also got a couple things coming up. One is Celebrate Wildlife Day, which uh, is going to be Saturday, May 2nd. So for those of you who might be able to come up to the rim, we had over a thousand people come to our inaugural event in November. This was going to be in May. And there's a rock card back there on that. And we would appreciate any kind of support you might want to give. Um, a lot of our information is now available on the web as well um, through uh, an e magazine called Canyon Sketches. And if you just wait just a sec. <coughs> I forgot one of my pieces of um, Anyway, so we're going to get started with tonight. I think it's Grand Canyon Association with our sponsor. Again, thank you. This is the third in a four part series on uh, essentially what's going on at Grand Canyon National Park, both <coughs> resource protection and preservation, conservation side of things. Um, a lot of people are, are, are interested in what we do behind the scenes, and we don't normally have a lot of opportunities to talk with the public and, you know, flag set a certain, you know, our community about what we're doing at the park. And Helen uh, Thompson, who's in the back of the room, suggested to us last year that we might want to think about ways that we could actually come out and talk more sort of on a real-time basis about some of the things that challenges we're facing, so the research is going on, things that haven't been published yet but are in the works. And tonight we're happy and pleased, and it's my pleasure, to have Carl Bowman, who's been a friend and a colleague and a staff member with us at Grand Canyon for a long time. I'm thinking about this, Carl and I first met um, during our first tours at Grand Canyon. Um, I've always been a resource manager, and Carl's moved around a little bit, but Carl um, has been I don't want to have that in lockup. Carl's been um, on and off of Grand Canyon since uh, about 1980. Um, so going on a long time, which is actually about as long as I've been there. Uh, Carl's first job was with the Park Service in 1974. He's kind of worked at Grand Canyon National Park. He's worked at Petrified Forest. He worked up in Alaska briefly, um, Denver Service Center, which is sort of our design group up in uh, Denver. Um, he's been sort of an all-around resource guy forever, and he's probably the smartest person that I know. Um, <laughs> it's true. Um, Carl's job right now is the Air Quality Specialist for Grand Canyon, and that really does speak to what he really does. Carl is the everything guy. Any question about geology, ask Carl. Anything about ozone pollution, ask Carl. Anything about gases, weather, conditions, ask Carl. Anything about smoke, ask Carl. Pretty much, you would just ask Carl. And tonight, Carl's going to uh, talk to us a little bit uh, for the next 45 minutes or so about climate change, something that's really critical for us to understand. And uh, he's been doing quite a bit of research on that. And uh, we're happy that Carl is here. And just uh, Carl will be transitioning from his current position as a research manager, actually, to do some more of the interpretive design work at Grand Canyon in the next uh, couple of years of his career. So. Um, this will be his last kind of formal lecture as a resource specialist at Grand Canyon. He's all excited about it. I don't get it. Anyways, um, Carl Bowman. Thanks. Um, thank you, Jim, and 
I think I do think you know more people than that. But anyway, uh, before I get started tonight, I did have uh, a couple of questions regarding the juxtaposition of the topic of tonight's presentation and today's date. Um, I want to assure you that we actually set this up before November 4th of last year. And the real reason that we're doing this tonight is because we're in the middle of Pledge Week and we figured that people would be so desperate for something else to listen to except for the pledge drive in case they knew that they would come. So we're going to be talking tonight about, about climate change. Um, and I'll tell you right now, right up front, uh, in, in the words of Mark Anthony, I come to bury climate change, not to praise him. Um, I'm going to be talking tonight, kind of like Mark Anthony did, going on to praise Julius, uh, talking tonight about some of the changes that we can expect out of the projected climate changes at Grand Canyon over the next century, and how we can apply what we can learn from the previous almost two billion years of Earth's history recorded in the walls of Grand Canyon. So I'm going to uh, start out uh, tonight first by talking a little bit about the atmosphere, the air, how it works, and why it's important for climate. Then I'm going to take a look at that long climatic past that we have here at Grand Canyon. What are some of the stories that the canyon can tell us about climate changes that have happened in the past, and then take a look at, at some of the things, not certainly everything, but some of the things that are projected to occur over the next hundred years. Now, as I move into this, one thing I want to point out is that there's really <clears throat> two kinds of research. There is research, the quest for the new, expanding the frontiers of knowledge, all that kind of stuff, and then there's re search, as in rehash, redigest, going in, finding out what other people have done, and putting it together and giving it to a group in Klein Library. So research is actually what I'm doing tonight. I'm going to be reporting on the work of other people and combining that in a way that uh, talks about the Grand Canyon. I'm not going to be startling you with any new scientific information. Maybe new to you, but I, I misinterpreted it out of a book someplace. So, we'll start out by looking at the air. And of course, ideally looking at air or looking for air is extremely difficult because it's supposed to be invisible. But I'm not going to be talking about visibility issues in the Grand Canyon tonight. Instead, what I'm going to be doing is talking about the air and how it's influenced the planet that we live on here. And of course, having an atmosphere is critically important. You know, we can look, we can look at our closest uh, neighbor in space, the moon. The moon gets the same amount of solar energy as the Earth does. It's the same distance from the sun as the Earth is. Uh, but the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. And so consequently, on the moon, during the middle of the day, it's 250 degrees outside Fahrenheit. And then at night, there's no air to hold the heat in, and so the temperature drops to 250 degrees below zero. We get these tremendous temperature swings on our closest neighbor in space because it doesn't have an atmosphere. So we want to have an atmosphere to uh, even out the temperatures, give us something to breathe. So we can look at our sister planet, Venus. Venus is about the same size as Earth. Uh, it has an atmosphere. Uh, since Venus is closer to the Sun than the Earth is, it does get about twice as much solar radiation as the Earth does. But the big thing about Venus is that its atmosphere is about 96% carbon dioxide. It's what we call a super greenhouse. So in contrast to the Moon with no atmosphere and tremendous temperature swings, Venus has a nice, even, steady temperature. If you go to visit Venus, you can count on the temperature being 867 degrees, day and night. Great place to melt lead. <laughs> so, then we have this planet that we live on, the one that's just right. Uh, Earth has had an atmosphere probably since the very beginning. That atmosphere has changed. 